Good, good morning, everybody. This is Jeff J. Brown, China Rising Radio, Sinoland, Shenzhen, just south of the Tropic of Cancer. And today I am really, really uh, honored and uh, happy to have on the show today Mr. James Bradley. How are you doing, James? I'm very good. Glad to be here, Jeff. Hey, listen, uh, for uh, uh, fans out there who might be listening the first time, I do use the word Eurangloland, and basically it's NATO, Western Europe, and we could even throw in Israel uh, since it's the uh, Western Empire's uh, Praetorian Guard in the Middle East. I may use the term Baba Beijing, which is my affectionate way, uh, my affectionate name for uh, China's leadership. So uh, uh, James has written uh, four books, uh, two uh, that cover w World War II, uh, Flags of Our Fathers and Flyboys. The other two are Imperial Cruise and The China Mirage. And uh, the, 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 these two explain how America got into World War II in the first place. Uh, and I have read just read the last two recently, and, and you know I'm, I'm a fellow writer, and I... I am thoroughly impressed, James. Uh, you know, with uh, with with what I with your two books because I I know I've read a good book when you know I I know a few things about Asia and um, and and I still learn such a huge amount of you know new facts, events, and history. So uh, that was the case for me with Imperial Cruise and China Mirage. So bravo! Thank you so much and. I'd like to say to your listeners, I do many, many interviews over the course of my career, and it's rare to be interviewed by somebody who actually reads and devours and studies the book <laughs> like your like you host, Jeff Brown. Before we dig into your two, and I mean, uh, you're, uh, I really want to encourage, you know, um, um, China Rising fans out there to read uh, James's two books. I mean, they are pull no punches books, and um, I experience. I just this is kind of a writer's question. I experienced something in reading them that that makes me want to ask you this: Do you feel an emotional detachment when you research all the horrific genocide and and racism that you write about? And maybe you even can keep that same you know cold bloodedness you know. Uh, you know, reading your own work, but when you read similar passages by other writers, all the feelings of, you know, disgust and revulsion manifest themselves because that's what happened to you. Uh, that's what happened to me, uh, you know, reading your books. I'm just curious. Well, my career started with I Iwo Jima. My father fought on Iwo Jima. And the Iwo Jima was a massacre. The bodies were stacked like cordwood. They couldn't bury them. Uh, tiny islands, smell of death. And if you start there and go on through human history, you realize, you know, from Teddy Roosevelt's waterboarding in the Philippines to Abu Ghraib today, uh, the last CIA or the, the woman who's nominated to head the CIA yeah, app app approved a waterboarding. It goes back to Teddy Roosevelt. So I don't think I'm writing about unusual uh, human behavior. I think what hits people is they don't read about it a lot because they don't want to know that side of human nature. And I'm not writing about it to focus on it. I'm writing about it because it's the norm when you send young boys out to war. Mm, like your father. Well, you got to kill and you got a gun, and you're 19, yeah. and, you know, I went to My Lai, and I was interviewing uh, My Lai, the massacre, 1968 in Vietnam, and Americans think that was a one-off, unusual yeah. thing. It's still presented that way, and at the end of the day, after hearing all these stories, my interpreter said, would you like to go to another Me Lai? It's just, <laughs> it's, just it's, it's just west of here, and if you don't want, if you don't like that one, we could go to one just north of here, and we could go to one east of here and go to one south of here. So it's it's what happens. What I'm trying to say in these books is, this is what happens when, uh, you know, you send uh, troops. They can be Chinese or Russian or American mm -hmm. or Mexican or whatever. But when we send our troops to countries where we don't speak the language, and, and uh, bad things happen. Yeah, absolutely. 
Well, let me ask you this. How did you get a, especially Imperial Cruise uh, past the, the gatekeepers at your publisher? I mean, did they edit it heavily? I mean, I just, I, I, I was surprised being, you know, I mean, you're, you're classified as a, quote, mainstream, you know, end of quote, writer. But how did you, uh, how did they, how did they react when you submitted the book? Well, can you tell me and the... <laughs> And the listeners, you know, what are you surprised by? Like, what are you surprised by that got by? Well, the Imperial Cruise just literally, well, you know, you and I are, there There are very few, you know, white guys out there who write uh, unflinchingly about Western racism. And and uh, so that's why, I mean, you just lay it all out and... And it's avoided, you know, people dance around it, you know, it, oh, we've gone past, you know, we've gone past that, you know, we had, you know, civil rights in the 1950s and 60s, and we're integrated now, okay. and Obama's president, and you just, you you know, and I do the same thing, I mean, and my writing, you know, racism is at the top of the list, because I think it's the genesis of so many of, uh, the horrible things that have happened and are going on in the world. So okay. I just, I, that's why I just, I just, you really, you know, spelled it out and it's refreshing because, you know, like I say, I do. And, and you're like one of the first, you know, uh, I, the, there's Indians and, you know, uh, people of color who write, have written about it very eloquently, but there's just very few Caucasians out there that do it. And that's why I was asking. Well, okay. Now I got it. The one thing that's very interesting, you write about racism, but in Imperial Cruise, I didn't. And let me explain. Racism was a word invented in the 1930s, and the Imperial Cruise takes place with Teddy, <laughs> with, 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 with Teddy Roosevelt. Yeah. Teddy, I was writing about racial theory. Yeah. Roosevelt, see, I'm, I'm doing the research about Roosevelt in the Philippines, and he's talking about how Americans have thousands of years of democracy in their veins, and the Filipinos don't. So I'm like thousands of years. Rome, <laughs> what, uh, Greece? No, that's that's not thousand. You know, ten thousand years of his. So I do the research, and he, uh, Teddy Roosevelt went to Harvard, and at Harvard, in the middle of the 19th century, there wasn't science. We we didn't know science. There was scientific speculation, theory. And the number one theory that drove scientists was racial theory. Mm -hmm. You measured skulls and big noses and small, you know, craniums and and the white man. And history showed that the white man was superior at that point. The whites were taking over the world. China was sinking. India was under the uh, boot of the British. The uh, the American Indian had had been wiped out. So scientific theory told Theodore Roosevelt these these racial theories that that you know the white was uh, uh, superior because they came from the Aryan thousands of years ago, and the Aryan became the Teuton, and the Teuton in the German forest became the Anglo-Saxon, mm -hmm. and the Anglo-Saxon swam across the Atlantic and created the American. So this was racial theory, and as you see in the book, Theodore Roosevelt was basing his um, foreign policy, not on some personal dirty racism, but on Harvard wonderful shiny racial theory. Yeah, that's true, and, and uh, that's something uh, that um, you know I'm I'm half Irish, and um, I wrote an article about racism, and there's a a, 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 a plate from a supposed a, 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 as you said at that time a a scientific journal, a credible well-respected scientific journal in, in the United Kingdom and it showed the it showed the silhouette of an Irishman an, they called him an Iberian and then a an Anglo-Saxon face and then a black face to show that uh, the Irish actually descended from Africans <laughs> so that, and that was considered as you said good science yeah Yale Harvard yeah. I went back and I read what these guys had studied and again it was it was racial theory. Yeah. The um, uh, it's really just uh, surreal as you as you kind of talked about in Imperial Cruise. You know, here we are in the Philippines. You know, in the late eighteen nineties. You know, early nineteen hundreds, and the Filipinos are waterboarding. 
uh, you know, uh, local natives. Uh, the the U.S. is is is, is ha- literally has a nationwide you know campaign of genocide. You know, to try to you know control the country on the ground. We can add concentration camps, and as you talked about, you know, untold numbers of milies, you know, massacres, raping, torching villages, etc. And even the uh, the Spanish uh, used uh, concentration camps uh, in the Philippines, and then the U.S. did the same thing. And um, you wrote about the fact that the word you know concentrata from Span- Spanish is where we get the word concentration camp. And uh, so I just I'm really impressed that you uh, wrote about all that. And um, so at what point I mean it you know th- and it, it did this idea of this white supremacy. You know, how did that, when did that fit into your, you know, your Western Empire puzzle that, to where it all started to make sense? Well, I was in San Francisco. The book, The Imperial Cruise, traces the cruise of Secretary of War, Howard Taft, William Howard Taft, who later became president. So it's Theodore Roosevelt's presidency, his Secretary of War's number one man is William Howard Taft, and he gets on a ship in San Francisco and goes to Hawaii, Philippines, China, Korea, and Japan. And on that cruise, he makes secret deals with Japan regarding Korea. I mean, he gave Korea to Japan, Theodore Roosevelt. Mm -hmm. He goes to the Philippines to see how the war is going. And I just write about, it's Theodore, it's the biggest uh, dispatch of a diplomatic delegation in US history. So I thought, I wonder what happened. So 100 years to the month, I set out on on my Imperial cruise. I shadowed them, and I went from San Francisco to Hawaii and blah, blah, blah. So I'm in the San Francisco library, and I'm reading William Howard Taft's speeches, and he's standing up, and he said, the Filipinos cannot have their freedom because they don't have the tens of thousands of years of history with democracy that we do. And, And as I told you, I'm stumped. I don't know what he's talking about. He's, and he's talking in code. Now, the key thing is that, as I said before, he's referring to racial theory that the that we came, us white people, came from the Aryans in the Aryan mountains. Iran, the, the, the word Iran for the uh, nation, comes from the word Aryan. And he's talking about the fact that Americans are part of the Aryan tradition of thousands of years it's race theory and i didn't get this till he went to yale and i went back and i studied the stuff he had studied at yale and then i broke the code but it's important to realize that the president of the united states and these top guys could speak to americans in 1905 in racial code and they all got it we were all walking around thinking that we were the pride of the Aryan race. Yeah, yeah, it's amazing, isn't it? There's, um, um, there's, uh, there's. I, I don't know if any, if you've read any of these books, but there's um, some some really you know good books that uh, you know that talk about this. Uh, you know, uh, Fran, you know, Franz Fanon. You know, he wrote um, the Wretched of the Earth and. Edward Galliano, uh, um, you know, he wrote uh, the the Memories of Fire trilogy, and uh, uh, China's Yan Fu, you know, you know, wrote in his essays. And um, are are there any other are there any other writers out there that uh, you know have that you know Caucasian or otherwise uh, uh, who have um, you know really informed you about you know western racism and genocide and imperialism and, and, and any of that you can recommend oh yeah many but you know i'm just now you're challenging me to be a lettered uh, <laughs> guy like jeff brown you know no my i would just suggest um Look at my bibliographies. I mean, okay, they're, yeah. They're full of yeah. They're full of great sources, <clears throat> and uh, you know, Mo- "Looking West" by Richard Drinian, I, I think, is the book that that uh, first opened my eyes. But my reading, you know, I'm just it's it's like I say, I, I'm I'm reading about Teddy Roosevelt talking. You know, I didn't realize it in code, and it was just breaking the code that. I realized, you know, what what they were really doing here. Well, that's what—go ahead, go ahead, James. Well, I was just going to say in the end, if anybody 
you know, wants to read a book, buy mine. Yeah, and mine too. <laughs> and, and Jeff's, mine first. <laughs> well, two that I can recommend uh, uh, out uh, to the to the fans out there are um, Savage Anxieties, uh, and and I'd like to ask you to send me after we finish, uh, send me the link to the to the to Looking West by Richard Dreary, and I'll add it to the article introduction. But two that really had a big impact on me were Savage Anxieties, uh, The Invention of Western Civilization by Robert William, Williams, Jr. Uh, he goes all the way back to the Greek, you know, the ancient Greeks, and he really gets into the prehistoric, as you say, I mean, I, I'm sure probably the Aryan, this, this Aryan myth is, is, is kind of grounded uh, in that in that period, uh, and he goes all the way up to the extermination of uh, the New World's um, First Nation peoples because he is actually a, a Native American. And then the other one is uh, it's really obscure and was actually originally written in Swedish and uh, but was translated into um, English, and that is exterminate all the brutes, um, mm -hmm. one man's mm -hmm. odyssey into the heart of darkness and the origins of European genocide by Sven Lindqvist. And um, mm -hmm. of course, the heart of darkness, exterminate all the brutes is the last line in um, Joseph Conrad's um, heart of darkness. Uh, um, um, I just had a brain burp. Joseph Conrad's, uh, oh God, I just had a, uh, a brain burp, his book. But uh, are you familiar with either of those books, James? Yes, of course. And, and for your listeners, I'd, I'd like to bring it down to, to my semi-educated level and say that, you know, we can intellectualize this, you know, racism and whatever. But what I would like to say about my writing of the Imperial Cruise, what I'm, what I'm, what I'm proving there is, let's say our grandfathers were bricklayers, or coal shovelers, or you know, train uh, locomotive engineers or whatever in 1905. The, they believed in this, simp they didn't know the word racism then; it hadn't been invented, but they believed that some Aryans arose in the Caucasus Mountains near Iran, and they had the race intelligence, it was called, to kill everybody who didn't look like them. Mm -hmm. And they flourished and they went west. This They went west. That's the key. The sun goes west. The sun is bright and white. And just like the bright sun, the Aryan went west, had the race intelligence, and it went to Germany. And in the dark uh, forest of Germany, the Aryan became the Teuton. And the Teuton was big and strong and had the race intelligence to kill everybody that didn't look like him. And he made a mistake. His, uh, he didn't make a mistake, but some of his offspring made a mistake and they went south. They went to Greece and Italy and Spain and they mated with those colored women. Yeah. And those societies didn't <laughs> flourish. It was the Teuton that kept the seed. See, it sounds funny, but this is what oh, I know, I our know. grandfathers believed. Now, the Teuton goes to England, becomes the Anglo-Saxon, massacres everyone that doesn't look like them, and that was the brilliance of the American. The American came to America and killed all the Indians rather than mate with them. Yeah. In Theodore Roosevelt's writings, he writes that that's the race intelligence of the American, is that we didn't mate with the natives yeah. like, like, like the Spanish did down in uh, South America. We kept the seed pure. Now you go into the into, you know, the uh, racism in the in the South in in the 20th century, and the argument was don't kill the goose that lays the golden egg. Keep the seed pure. The reason you couldn't mix with other races was because the Aryan, the Teuton, the Anglo-Saxon, and the American had the what was called the race intelligence to keep the seed pure. Yeah. And it was the pure seed that would be the would be the locomotive pulling all the other uh, cars of civilization. Now, you know, whatever you think of that, what I'm trying to say is our great grandfathers in 1905 would not have even turned their head if I said all that. Yeah, that that was what they believed. 
Well, I, th- I think I think uh, I think that um, that mentality still exists uh, uh, subconsciously and maybe even consciously uh, in the halls of power in uh, your Anglo land. Uh, I, I don't think um, it's just as you said. Now they internalize it and they uh, they're not as open about it. Uh, uh, but I but I but I think that I think that philosophy is still there. What do you think? I think so. And 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 again. You know, we're we're we're, t- we're speaking intellectually about what books affected us. It wasn't books that gave me the insight. When I was 19, I hitchhiked around the world. I literally went around the fat of the globe. I walked across Afghanistan. Cool. I- Iran. You know, I started. I went to school in Japan. So I got, went all the way from Tokyo to London uh, for two years, and slowly I began. You know, I had come from Wisconsin. I was a member of a, a Christian tribe, Catholics, Northern Wisconsin, and I had been taught, you know, these things are true. Uh, Jesus, a dead man, rose, and and then, but people in India, they have superstitions. Yeah, you know? of course. And people in China have superstitions. Well, and going around the world as a young man, I just noticed, wow, you know, mothers all suckle their kids. There's similarities here. People get up in the morning and they have breakfast. They sleep at night. Uh, when a son dies, the tears from the parents, they're similar. You know, and I, I, so the differences faded and I began to see that we're all the same. And as my mother once said when I was writing, she said, all wars are civil wars because we're fighting each other. So if you look at that whole, so it's just that holistic view that uh, that was formed in my mind as, as, as a young guy. So I'm, I'm just, you know, trying to put it across that maybe those people that were taught are so different than us, maybe they're not. Well, it's interesting. Your, so your arc of awareness really started early. Um, I, um, uh, I guess I wasn't quite so, uh, well, I, I was, you know, I was in the Peace Corps for two years in, in, uh, in Tunisia, North Africa. And, and um, and you know I should have been a, a, a little bit more aware back then, but I you know and I I think I was, but I still clung to the for years and years and years up until basically you know uh, when I came to China in the early 90s, and then I came back in 2010. I still clung to the myth of you know the American democracy being the great you know shining temple on the hill and. And, uh, you know, I still thought, you know, in 2010, when I came back here for the second time, I thought, you know, you know, Bill Clinton and Hillary Clinton were, you know, great people and Hillary would make a great president. And so it, it, for me, it took a long time to, um, you know, to, to really, you know, pull the scales off my eyes. Um, I wanted to ask you, you know, of course, you, um, um, you, you do talk uh, in, in the, um, especially in um, uh, the China Mirage about the, uh, about the missionaries um, and uh, their role uh, in China before uh, liberation in 1949. And, you know, except for militarized uh, Japan, uh, where they, when they took a, you know, a Shinto sect and kind of fused it into the, you know, onto the imperial armies, you know, rape and plunder of Asia. Buddhism just doesn't seem to have a history of genocide and on other peoples. Um, and uh, even Genghis Khan, I was shocked to learn that, you know, he actually dabbled in, and uh, in, in his, and in his sons dabbled in Christianity and Islam as, as they, you know, massacred their way across Asia to create the world's largest empire. So thinking about how missionaries played such a big role in your China Mirage story, do you think that Westerners' expansionist uh, racism, or as you call it, uh, race intelligence, is in any way correlated to Christianity's strong evangelical drive, you know, to convert people? Because it is there. Well, yeah, the foundation, I mean, Western explorers, the Portuguese and the Spanish, in the beginning, and then the French uh, were all went out with the blessing of the Pope. And there are papal bulls that I'm working on in my next book, back in the 13 and 1400s, where they, you know, the infidel was an uh, was was uh, uh, didn't have fidelity, didn't believe, was outside 
the circle of humans. Humans believed in the Catholic dogma. So you, the king of Portugal or Spain, and then later France, you know, have the right to subjugate uh, these people and to take their lands because they're unbelievers. I mean, this is the beginning of the white man uh, going out to other lands. So they, they weren't horrible racists. They were, you know, they put the banner of the Catholic Church uh, in the ground. Christopher Columbus, right? yeah. all the pictures show him with crosses and missionaries. Yeah. You know, they came to do good. And the good was to uh, enslave these uh, non-Christians, knock some sense in their head. Yeah. So the Crusades, see, that was... You know, that wasn't aggressive uh, Europeans going down there to wreak havoc. That was that was good Catholics going down to knock some sense into those Muslims. And once we put missionaries into a land, it was called the um, Protectorate of Missions. There was another, you know, papal, papal bull, another law that came from the Vatican that said once you put those missionaries in there, they're doing the right thing. They're trying to get the infidels to get on the right side here by becoming Christian. And once they're threatened, you, the state, France, Portugal, Spain, whatever, you've got the right to go in there and kill to protect those missionaries. So yeah, the foundation of, of the white man going out was all, all sanctioned this way. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Well, moving along uh, on this trail of tears, (laughs) I want to uh, uh, compliment you as well uh, uh, in the China Mirage. Um, you know, your willingness to talk about the, the West, you know, grotesque illegal drug empire uh, from the latter part of the 18th century uh, all the way up until China was liberated uh, by the communists in 1949. And I've also written a lot about it, and, but, but more from the perspective of the Chinese. And, but you really expose just how wide and deep imperial drug money you know, penetrated American society and the economy in the 19th and 20th centuries. And I I found a quote, and and I've used it in in my writings, that someone said that the Western drug cartel was the largest and longest running, most profitable criminal enterprise in human history. Although uh, an an argument could be made that Western slavery was right up there, you know, in, in the same category. Do you agree? Well, I, it's just a fact. The largest, oh, many, you know, there's many, many documented sources. The largest commodity trade of that time, 19th century, was what? Oil wasn't around. Wheat, rice, uh, kerosene. No, it was opium. Drugs yeah. are always the most profitable. Opium was the number one most valuable traded Mm. commodity of the 19th century. Opium accounted for almost a quarter of the British Empire's wealth. I mean, look at how costly it is for America to have 100 plus bases around the world. Empire is not profitable. Mm -hmm. It's a drag on the treasury. Well, how did the British Empire get so rich with all that costly empire, it was opium. Opium was the magic plant that uh, turned empire into silver. It was huge, absolutely enormous. Why, you know, the Chinese emperor says, okay, let's be fair, don't poison us, uh, don't, don't run your opium in here, it's illegal. Why would a young Queen Victoria immediately dispatch the Royal Navy halfway around the world to bombard China mm-hmm. because she was getting 25% of her income from opium. Yeah, It was absolutely critical. It wasn't something to negotiate. She needed that lifeline of, of money. Queen Victoria is the largest drug dealer in history. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I, I, I remember reading that quote in, uh, <laughs> in the China Mirage. It's excellent. All right. This is uh, this is uh, really interesting, and um, the next thing I wanted to ask you about um, is I also really appreciated uh, in the China Mirage your your accurate portrayal of uh, Chiang Kai Shek. And for those of you who you know need to dig into your memory, Chiang Kai Shek was the leader of the uh, KMT, the Kuomintang uh, in China, 
fought against uh, uh, Mao and lost um, lost uh, ignominiously and, and was run off to Taiwan. Um, and I have written that he was a, a, quote, corrupt, inept, fascist gangster, end of quote. Uh, would you like to comment on that? Well, he, he was. <laughs> You know, but here, just a, this was the Chinese Civil War. Mao was not a kindergarten teacher. Yeah, yeah, you know, you yeah. uh, power comes out of a, the barrel of a the gun. Of a gun yeah. And they both thought that way. What was very interesting about Chang is not what he was, but what he was sold to America as. Yeah. He married into the Song family, who had been educated in the United States. And they understood the China Mirage. What's the China Mirage? The China Mirage is the American belief that lives today that those Chinese are going to throw off their despotic government and become more like us. Underneath it all, they want to become little Democrats like us. They want and and Christian and Christians too. And, yeah, and Christian. So the Song family says to Chiang Kai Shek. We have to, you know, propagandize you as a Christian into America. So this was a Christian head of China, and there would be trickle-down democracy. So Henry Luce, head of Time, Inc., whose father was a missionary, got on board. Franklin Roosevelt got on board. And Chiang Kai-shek was sold into 1920s, 30s, and 40s America as the rising Christian who will Christianize all of China. So it's, it's really, I, th I think the big story for me in the China Mirage is how he was sold and believed. Pearl Buck, Henry Luce, Franklin Roosevelt, all promising America for just a few billion dollars more to Chiang Kai-shek, we're going to have white steeple Christian churches <laughs> all across China. And then, no, but that's, no, it's he, true. No, it's, it's key true. because the shock, who lost China? I mean, I'm writing about Vietnam right now. And David Halberstam, who wrote Best and the Brightest in 1972. Well, in 1992, he wrote the introduction to the 20th uh, anniversary edition. And he said, if I could rewrite the powers, uh, the, the Best and the Brightest, the book, he said, I would... I would more heavily emphasize the McCarthy who lost China period. He said the fear of losing Vietnam was in every 1960s politician's mind. Lyndon Johnson, John Kennedy, they were afraid of the blowback of because they saw Harry Truman knifed in the who lost China fights. Well, why was that such a shock? Who lost China? It was such a shock because the American public had been marinated in 30 years of propaganda that mm -hmm. Chiang Kai-shek was a Christian beloved by the Christian wannabes Chinese. And when Mao got the mandate of heaven, it wasn't a shock to the Chinese as much as it was to the Americans. And yeah. that begat who lost China, which begat you can't lose in Korea and you can't <laughs> lose in Vietnam. <laughs> And millions dead in the, in the process. Well, speaking speaking of uh, Mao, um, uh, another thing I'd like to compliment you on in, in the China Mirage, and, and again, this is uh, um, usually uh, uh, sort of a taboo, uh, you know, a taboo subject uh, in a lot of uh, a lot of other books. But you you have a you you really have an honest appraisal of Mao Zedong and the Communist Party. You know, and how successful they were, you know, in ridding the country of, you know, fascist Japanese and, the, and Chiang Kai-shek's KMT, not to mention all the drug dealing uh, Western colonialists and all the, you know, all the wonderful things that they, you know, did for the vast majority of the citizens. And uh, so something that I have written about is that in addition to the West's behavior being you know, totally distorted by, you know, this deep-seated sense of white supremacy. It is multiplied, you know, logarithmically by the West's, you know, zealous hatred of communism and rabid fear of socialism. Do you think that that's, uh, what do you think? Uh, can you state the question again? Well, that, uh, that in addition to, that in addition to, this this innate sense of white superiority, you know, the, the the racial intelligence that you were talking about, 
that Western, especially American, uh, uh, foreign policy, um, uh, geopolitics, has also been completely distorted by its rabid fear of, uh, of communism. Yeah, it's just unbelievable. I mean, you know, I don't know how many thousands of examples I could I could uh, uh, bring up to. Uh, it's just another world. I mean, uh, Secretary of State the Dean Acheson under Truman is announcing to the United States that Ho Chi Minh is the enemy of Vietnamese independence. <laughs> He's a commie because you know, what commies want to do is enslave people. And at the time, Ho Chi Minh was beating the French, and he was the national hero. <laughs> you know, he was beyond George Washington. He was like all the founding fathers put into one. <laughs> and and people are painting pictures of Ho Chi Minh on the side of their houses, and and you know, going crazy over this guy because he's got the secret to throw off foreign domination, and. And Dean Acheson and all the geniuses in the uh, in Washington are saying this guy's bad for you, Vietnam. <laughs> so, so the cath so the French Catholics are beaten, and I don't know if people realize this, but w what America did is we we hired all the people who worked for the French Catholics. <laughs> so, so the number one thing in 20th century Vietnamese history, if you go back, let's just pick a date, like 1960. At that point, if I walked up to a Vietnamese, the thing they're proudest the most is that Ho Chi Minh led them to beat the French. Yeah. yeah. Okay, well, then they look to the Saigon Potemkin government that the CIA set up, and everybody fought against them to keep the French there. You know, <laughs> President Tu, President Ki, the, these guys were all Catholics who had served as officers in the French military, yeah. bombing Vietnamese villages. Their own people. <laughs> bombing their own people. So it's just like a, a it's all, so when you say did our fear of communism distort things, it wouldn't have let us see things. I mean, Nixon, still today, people, you know, oh, Nixon opened China. And I'm like, you know, well, if you read the China Mirage, you'll see that Mao reached out to the State Department under Roosevelt and said, I want to come to Washington and explain that I don't want to deal with Moscow. Moscow has borscht, you know, <laughs> that, and, and it's too cold. I want Ma wanted Wall Street. Yeah. What, what has happened with China and America, Chinese ingenuity and labor and American technology and capital, Mao was talking about that in a cave to a State Department guy in 1944. Yeah, and, and he wanted to go explain that to Roosevelt. Well, Roosevelt wouldn't see him, so then Mao reached out to Truman. Truman wouldn't see him. He reached out to Eisenhower. He reached out to Kennedy. He reached out to Johnson. Mao was always saying, "America, China, let's get together." So Nixon finally realizes, like forty years later, what Mao was talking about, and then. You know, we, we put a crown on Nixon's head. Oh, he opened China. <laughs> Mao was talking about the Nixon move for 40 years. <laughs> oh, my gosh. And, 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 and millions dead later, unfortunately. Well, you know, this ism, the domino theory. You know, I, I, I've, I'm in Vietnam. I've interviewed a lot of American vets. They were under the domino theory. If, yeah. if Vietnam falls, all of Asia is going to fall to China. Yeah. Well, at the end of his life, Robert McNamara gave an interview, and he said, the domino theory drove us, but now that I look at it, it was never studied within the U.S. government. There was no <laughs> official study. Nobody ever said, does this make sense? It was a belief. I mean, the best and the brightest, John Kennedy... Johnson, Nixon, McNamara, Bundy, these are big brains. And they're operating under a myth that could never happen. It had no foundation. Mm -hmm. yeah. You know, it's just the New York Times is writing about a Russian hack. Three years ago, it was proved by these uh, ex-CIA guys. You can see it at consortium.com. There was no hack. The information went out on a, a, on a, a USB drive. It wasn't a hack. You know, it's just there, but there's a belief system. You can have people believe stuff and they walk into walls. 
Well, that's why, uh, you know, you, you really do a, a great job <clears throat> of showing in the China Mirage, you know, how there was this, <clears throat> you know, tripartite of the U.S. government, the Chinese government, which is, you know, which is tantamount, you know, to treason, you know, Wall Street, the church, well, it's more, of a, more, more than a tripartite. It, you had Wall Street, the churches working, all of those elements working hand in hand with Western media to just, you know, put out the just, you know, d- you know decade after decade of, of, of r- r- fake news. I mean, it was total propaganda. And um, I don't, you know, as you just pointed out, I mean, I don't know what you think, but I don't think it's much better. I don't think it's gotten any better. In fact, if anything, it's gotten worse because of all the ability to adopt all the sophisticated technology. Uh, what do you think about uh, what do you think about uh, the Western media today? Uh, well, the, I don't read it. Um, <laughs> it's, no, it's it's corporate media, and I'm not criticizing it. It's just it, you know, it says what. See, the thing about China, I go to China and I say, this is what your media says, and they said, well, it's propaganda, state control, and I think that's a healthier uh, attitude. Americans mm-hmm. don't understand that their media is state control. Mm-hmm. At least the Chinese are honest about it. Yeah, and it is, you know, Americans are under the illusion that um, they have a free press. And they don't. And I just, I'd like to quote the, the great philosopher George Carlin, who, who said, you know, I love America and all the rights that we used to have. <laughs> I think we started losing them back in about the 1880s <laughs> with the oil, with the oil and steel and railroad uh, magnates. But um, uh, Jeff, I'll, I'll go give ahead. You a link. If you're doing links, I'll give the audience a link on a Swiss institute that has studied American media, and with graphs they show the, they show how it's controlled, where it comes from. No, oh, please very, do. It's very simple. But they spent years on this, and I think every American should see it. It's All right. a Swiss, Swiss link regarding America. The, the, the title of the four-page article with two graphs is uh, American Empire and its Media. Okay, cool. I'm excited to see that. Thank you. Uh, one more taboo subject. I mean, um, uh, you, you may... You, um, you may you may think I'm 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 uh, you may want to hang up on me, but I'm gonna I'm gonna bring up uh, another one that I've been dealing with recently, and and, and again I, for me it's just been like peeling an onion and 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 putting all the pieces of Western Empire, you know, in into the into the puzzle to make to make it make sense. And the final the final piece of the puzzle with after you know white supremacy, racism, imperialism, colonialism. I have now added capitalism to the to the puzzle to complete it, uh, and I realize that capitalism is like you know almost like a, a religion. It's like a god, but are um, you know do you do you think that capitalism is an important element in uh, Western Empire and its drive to dominate the world? Uh, yes, of course, but. You know, for me to be a capitalist, I'd have to move. I'm an American. For me to be a capitalist, I'd have to go to Singapore uh, or Hong Kong, maybe a couple other places. America's not a capitalist system. It's a socialist system. Uh, cradle the grave for the military, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Complete socialist system. Uh, cradle the grave for the banksters. Yeah. They, they, they can't lose. So, you know. The profits are theirs, and the losses are the taxpayers to pay. So there's not a, you know, the capitalist, I don't know. I See, for me, a communist and capitalist system has not really existed. Well, that's true. You know, I mean, Mao was an emperor. And I see the Chinese system as an emperor system. With, it's just a committee now. The emperor is a committee. And the idea, and so... To talk about capitalism today in America, it's it's not there. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Uh, well, just looking back, uh, you know, I've I've written, you know, f- you know that of course it all started in the 15th century, and and it has just been, yeah. You know, I don't know if you've ever seen the the quote by you know Dharam Paul, the great Indian um, 
uh, I've actually found this the, the source document where he did he did uh, actuarial and statistical studies on the census of um, of of the um, Indian subcontinent, and he came up with a over the 300 years that the, that the British were there that that uh, he calculated that that the British system in in uh, in the Indian subcontinent. Uh, uh, shorten the lives of no fewer than 500 million people and it sounds like a lot but when you stretch it out over 300 years it's only a few million a year and uh, he said it could be he said it could be as high as you know one and a half billion so I very candidly you know uh, very openly say you know Western Empire has is, re- is responsible for the <clears throat> the death of a billion people since the 15th century and and it just goes on and on and on, you know, Afghanistan, Syria, you know, um, color revolutions, false flags. I mean, it's just, you know, all the way up to today's headlines. And I love the end of your book uh, in uh, the Imperial Cruise. You say, so many still follow the, the sun. In other words, you're saying, you're suggesting that so many still follow the, uh, the Aryan myth of white supremacy. What, you know, is it ever going to stop? I mean, it, you know, what, it, what can we do before your Land, you know, you know, possibly destroys the world and wipes out humanity? As you said, they're, they're there to, to wipe everybody else out so that they can have it all to themselves. What can we do? Well, two thoughts. N- number one, we've got to look at the profit motive. I mean, you know, v- Vietnam, the Vietnam War is thought of as a tragedy by Americans. I look at it as a profit center. Yeah, well. Uh... If, if, if you had the Vietnam account at Chase Manhattan Bank, uh, you, you made generational wealth. Mm-hmm. That this, you know, it's not, an imp- it's not capitalism's impulse to kill. It's the vast profits that are involved here. When you build a school in America, Geez, that's a tiresome process. You got to have committee meetings and bids, and you know people look at the numbers, and you built the school, and the darn thing lasts for a hundred years, and you know there's not a lot of money in it. When you build a fighter jet, it crashes. You got to build another one. You need better bombs. You know more five hundred million dollars of research for a, for a, you know for something that won't turn out, but there's five hundred million dollars spent on the research. So war is vastly profitable. Yeah. It's it, the the profit of war is just unbelievable. When you can when you can go into Afghanistan and within 3 years the uh, general accounting office says geez there's 6 billion unaccounted for. Mm-hmm. Well, those are pallets a month. I mean that's that's pretty profitable. That doesn't happen when you're building roads and sewers and infrastructure <laughs> in America. And, pay, so, and paying off municipal bonds. <laughs> so, you know, so the profit in war is huge. And I, I, th- I think that's a huge driver, but we don't want to look at it because our leaders talk about WMD and fear and poisoning and, you know, and glory and all these other things that we sheeple who are propagandized by the corporate media will believe. Yeah. And all I'm, uh, all I'm saying is, well, let's look over here at the dollar. What happens with this dollars and cents thing? Yeah. You know? And yeah. that is the driver. Pa- pallets of money also went missing, and literally pallets. I mean, I saw photographs of them. Pallets of money in Iraq also went missing. Billions of dollars of, of pallets of money uh, just disappeared into the... Uh, <clears throat> into the bowels of war uh, in Iraq. So, um, well, listen, uh, two final questions, uh, and maybe this is part of your way of uh, trying to, to, to stop um, uh, Western Empire and its genocide. Um, you have founded the Bradley Peace Foundation and another organization called Youth for Understanding. Uh, what do you hope to accomplish? Well, Youth for Understanding is a big worldwide organization founded in the 50s. And I just, I kind of buy scholarships there. Oh, Otherwise, okay, I see. All right. It, you know, I don't have the, I don't have the infrastructure to do medical insurance and, you know, <laughs> and all that stuff. But, so I just, 
You know, my dad fought in a massacre at I in Iwo Jima, and I wrote a book, and I thought some of this money's got to go to understand these, <laughs> to, st to stop these massacres. So I've given scholarships for kids to go uh, to okay. J Japan, uh, China, and Vietnam and study. And the idea is very simple. I just think if you take an American mushhead kid and put their mush head in the living room of an Asian mother for a year, they might come back with changed minds. And the next time, 20 years from now, we're thinking whether we should fight it out or talk about it. Maybe <laughs> one of these kids will make a difference. Yeah. The, uh, well, that's why the, you know, that was the, uh, one of the raison d'etre of the Peace Corps. And um, you know, to send kids out and uh, you know, one of the missions is, is to come back and, and be able to uh, explain to Americans, you know, what, you know, what we learned when I, you know, when I came back from the Peace Corps. And uh, well, tell us about the Bradley Peace Foundation. That's got your name on it, so you must have some association. Oh yeah, no, that's all it is. The James, you know, a kid applies to the James Bradley Oh, Peace I for see. A okay, I get, I got it. I send it. them through the Youth for Understanding. Oh, so. cool. Okay, so it's like a like a like a co a cooperative deal. Okay, that's cool. It's a it's a found, you know it's a legal foundation. Okay, but it differs from the Peace Corps in that you know the Peace Corps. John Kennedy said we're going to go help people. James Bradley Foundation says. You're gonna go get helped. You know, you're, you're not going as a missionary to teach the people how to wash their hands. You know, you're going, you're going to sit in a Asian mother's living room, and 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 learn. <laughs> One last question. You're now living and writing in Vietnam, and <clears throat> you're on the tiny archipelago. Is is it Gondau or how do you pronounce Kondau. that? Coindao. I know Dao means island because that's actually a Chinese word. Uh, and, and it was France's <clears throat> colonial, you know, penal uh, prison. It's about an hour's commuter flight uh, south of the south coast of, uh, Viet of Vietnam. Is this going to be the story of your next book? And um, tell us what your current, uh, your current writing project is. I'm writing a book called How Vietnam Won, and it's centered on the island of Koh Dao. But I've done 10 years of interviews with the winners. So if you look at the Ken Burns documentary on Vietnam, or if you read, uh, just line up 300 books written by Americans, <laughs> they all have the underlying assumption that we could have won if only. If, yeah, I, yeah. I mean, McNamara and Bundy went to their death studying their papers, trying to figure out where they went wrong, which means if they had only zigged, maybe that we would have won, you know? Or if they had zagged in here, so there's this, there's this, there's this uh, common assumption among Americans that we could have won in Vietnam if the hippies hadn't, if the media hadn't, <laughs> if the military had only, if in 1962 we just went up and if we had turned North Vietnam into a parking. There's all these ifs, but the point is we lost. So I just went around Vietnam saying, "How'd you win?" And I'm writing a book that. I hope will explain to America uh, that it was not that America lost. It was that Vietnam had the strategies and tactics to win, and they implemented them. Yeah, absolutely. Well, you know, Wilfred Brichette, uh, he wrote a book called, uh, in fact, I just wrote an article about it. I'll send you the link if you haven't read it. Um, I've, I've read the link, and I've read the book twice. Okay, great, yeah. Vietnam will win, and man, you talk about, whew, you talk about, you know, it's like it's it's like your descriptions of um, American imperialism in the Philippines. It's it's a hard slog reading it because it's you know, just uh, the brutality and the cruelty and the inhumaneness of, of what of what we did there is just um, is uh, takes your breath away. Uh, um, unfortunately, it was very profitable. Yeah, it was it was a <laughs> real winner for a lot of people. Yeah. Yeah, there, yeah. there were people riding motorboats on the Mekong River here in Saigon, living great lives. Yeah, uh, yeah. Uh, David Rockefeller ran all the money through Chase Manhattan Bank. He made a fortune. Yeah, yeah. But, but Wilfred Burchett, if I could just say to the listeners, he, he's a hero of Jeff's and mine. No, oh, absolutely. Wilf, you know, so all the American, if uh, Americans who think they have a free press, all the American correspondents were staying in four. <laughs> 
air-conditioned hotels in downtown <laughs> Saigon. And when they went to look at the war, they had to go to the U.S. military, get on a military vehicle, and they got in the back end of the war. They saw the American side. Wilfred Burchett is the only guy who put on Ho Chi Minh sandals and walked behind the, the lines down the Ho Chi Minh Trail. Yeah. And he's the only guy who saw the war. Yeah. And he's the only guy who was accurate. So we have all these American, you know, they won Pulitzer Prizes, but they were only looking through the peephole of the U.S. military. Yeah. And they got it wrong. And the they guy were, who go ahead. saw the whole thing got it right. Yeah, I, I put a very tongue, you know, I put a photo of Wilfred Burchette in my article where he, he, as you said, he was in sandals and, and uh, you know, wearing a, a, a peasant's um, sun hat. And, and uh, he was amazing. He just, and I, he, is, he is a, he is a, he is a hero of mine, uh, as you said, and, and of yours. So, um, well, listen, um, I'll, and I'll add that link to the article uh, that, to introduce our interview. Listen, uh, James, uh, you have been very generous with your time. I want to thank you so much for being on China Rising Radio Sinoland. It's been a terrific uh, interview and having you on, and I appreciate your frankness and openness to talk about subjects that uh, are often swept under the rug uh, in, in the United States. Um, and so uh, really appreciate you having on and um, let's stay in touch. Thank you very much. And I congratulate your listeners for the intelligence to listen to Jeff Brown. <laughs> I'll uh, be sending you an email to ask you to send, send me some links and I uh, should have this up in the next 48 hours. Okay, you've got the link to the Swiss uh, thing already I sent it. All right, thanks a lot, James. Talk okay, to you no. soon. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.